The title of this lecture is The Catalytic Choice in the Voice of the Silence. Thou art enlightened, choose thy way. My name is William Wilson Quinn. Above all else, a voice is a tool of communication. Normally, when communicating, a voice produces measurable sound, except when the discourse is metaphysical and the method uses the two highest of the seven principles of the human being, the sixth principle, or buddhi, intuition, which is infused with the divine emanations of the seventh principle, or atma. Then communication is silent. And while the voice within this spiritual conversation may be metaphoric, the metaphysical content being communicated is quite real. When perceived in this way, the otherwise facially inscrutable term voice of the silence makes perfect sense, allowing as it does discourse upon the ineffable. As prefatory to our discussion of the book first published in London in 1889 entitled The Voice of the Silence, it is important to highlight two of its significant features. First, it is neither an original work of nonfiction nor of fiction, but rather a translation of chosen fragments of an ancient text referred to in English as the Book of Golden Precepts. We have as authority for this assertion of translation the declaration of the translator herself, H.P. Blavatsky, or H.P.B., who in the last paragraph of her preface to the book states, quote, in this translation, I have done my best to preserve the poetical beauty of language and imagery which characterize the original, end quote. The second significant feature of the book concerns the identity and vocations of those for whom HPB labored to produce this translation. She specifically identifies them on the title page. It was produced, she wrote, for those ascending the higher spiritual path. Quote, for the daily use of lanus, disciples, end quote. These same lanus, together with their adept gurus, are also those to whom the book is dedicated. Quote, dedicated to the few, end quote. One important fact we learn from HPB about the origins of these ancient fragments she translated was that some of them are pre-Buddhistic. She does not elaborate on this assertion, so one could theorize that they might be derived from Vedic sources, from Brahmaism, the pervasive religious belief in northern India both prior to and during the Buddha's appearance there around 500 BCE. However, one might also as easily conclude that these fragments are even older and cannot be claimed by any specific religion of antiquity. Rather, they may be ancient remnants of unknown origin of some work elucidating the core principles of the immemorial Philosophia Perennis, or perennial philosophy, whose most recent and highly valuable restatement into modern English occurred during the late 19th century as theosophy. This restatement was HBB's primary mission during her later years, as is evidenced by this inspiring translation, among others, into English. She also writes in her preface that, quote, 
the work from which I here translate, being the book of the Golden Precepts, forms part of the same series as that from which the stanzas of the book of Zahn were taken, on which the secret doctrine is based. End quote. HPB tells us elsewhere that the book of Zian is, quote, the first volume of the commentaries upon the seven secret folios of QT, end quote, and that the exoteric corpus of the books of QT comprise 35 volumes, while the esoteric writings related to them are in 14 volumes of commentaries. She also claims, surprisingly, that the commentaries are in fact older, her term of untold antiquity, than the 35 volume set of exoteric writings of the books of QT, which she describes of, as, quote, comparatively modern, end quote. She adds that the esoteric commentaries can all be traced to, quote, one small archaic folio, end quote, called the Book of the Secret Wisdom of the World, that she further describes as, quote, a digest of all the occult sciences, end quote. It is from this small folio that presumably the fragments of the Book of Golden Precepts derive and were translated by HPB from memory into the Voice of the Silence. As to HPB's memorization of the original text, we have two reliable accounts to support HPB's own assertion in the preface that, quote, I know many of these golden precepts by heart, end quote. The first such account is from Annie Besant, who was an eyewitness to HPB manually translating the voice of the silence with pen and paper in Fontainebleau, France, in the year 1889. There, on a visit from London, Besant, who was new to the theosophical milieu but had quickly become a protege of HPB, later published her own account of this process. Quote, I know that she, HPB, did not write it referring to any books, but she wrote it down steadily, hour after hour, exactly as though she were writing either from memory or from reading it where no book was." End quote. The second account regarding HPB's memory of the text is found in an 1881 letter written by the adept Kutumi, or K.H., addressed to A.P. Sinnott, some eight years before she translated the text. In this letter, K.H. advises Sinnott to, quote, read the book of QT and you will find in it these laws. She, meaning HPB, might translate for you some paragraphs as she knows them by rote, end quote. Thus it was from her memory alone that HPB translated this remarkable and valuable hieratic work in 1889. In her preface, she also noted certain characteristics about the ancient text, such as, quote, the original precepts are engraved on thin oblong squares, copies very often on discs, end quote. Additionally, she noted, quote, they are written variously, sometimes in Tibetan, but mostly in ideographs. The sacerdotal language, Senzar, besides an alphabet of its own, may be rendered in several modes of writing in cipher characters, which partake more of the nature of ideographs than of symbols." End quote. How similar all this seems in provenance and perhaps in some degree to method, to her writing The Secret Doctrine. In the proem to volume one of that book, HPB declares that, quote, an archaic manuscript is before the writer's eye, 
end quote, whose pages begin with, quote, an immaculate white disc, end quote, which is then followed by the same disc with a, quote, central point, end quote, in it, and thereafter a disc where that central point is, quote, transformed into a diameter, end quote, and so on in a long, informative sequence of ideographs and symbols. The term Lanu appears no fewer than 14 times in the text of the Voice of the Silence. So it is necessary for the reader to understand what this Sanskrit word means. HPB's written corpus contains more than one definition of it, which begins in the Secret Doctrine where she provides this definition. Quote, Lanu is a student, a chela who studies practical esotericism. End quote. Another definition can be found in her posthumous theosophical glossary, which is, quote, Lanu, Sanskrit, a disciple, the same as chela. End quote. Alanu, however, is apparently no ordinary chela or lay chela, at least applied to its use in the voice of the silence. But HPB provides no definition for the word in this book, which is curious, given both the significance and prominence of the term lanu within its pages. However, a year before she traveled to Fontainebleau and there translated The Voice of the Silence, HPB published an article in the journal Lucifer titled, quote, Practical Occultism, end quote, in which she revealed a highly significant element of the definition of Lanu that apparently is found only in that article within all her writings. There, she states, quote, Be it remembered that all chelas, even lay disciples, are called upasaka until after their first initiation, when they become lanu upasaka, end quote. If this is accurate, then it necessarily means that all lanus are initiates of the order to which HBB and her own teachers belong. As such, Elanu is well past the trial of probation in order to become a chela of an adept, also well past the portal of acceptance as a chela of such an adept, and further has made significant advancement on the higher spiritual path by having achieved the milestone of the first initiation. So these are the Lanus or junior initiates for whom and for whose use HPB translated the voice of the silence. Quote, for the daily use of Lanus, end quote. It also establishes that this is not a book suited to those who are only beginning their spiritual journeys, but rather is a book primarily for those at or near the level of spiritual advancement of the newly initiated, who have risen from the ranks of accepted chelas of senior initiates or adepts. Much less is said in the voice of the silence about the gurus of the lanus than about the lanus and their onerous curriculum. But that these gurus are themselves higher or senior initiates is made clear. Following two verses in the first of the book's three fragments, which make reference to, quote, wise ones, end quote, in all capital letters, is a verse that directs the disciple to, quote, seek for him who is to give thee birth in the hall of wisdom, end quote. In a footnote on the single word birth, 
This word is expanded in the note to, quote, spiritual or second birth, end quote, which we understand as a reference to initiation. The full note in the glossary is this, quote, the initiate who leads the disciple through the knowledge given to him to his spiritual or second birth is called the father, guru, or master, end quote. In initiatic terms, this literally describes the process or sacred rite of transmission. And in this context, it describes the relationship between new initiate and adept. It nonetheless stands to reason that the ancient Book of the Golden Precepts, as translated into the Voice of the Silence, should focus its attention on Lanus. Their journeys, within the context of this book, begin at initiation and end at the point of liberation where the ultimate choice must be made between entering nirvana or deferring entry until all of humanity has achieved the same liberation from repeated deaths and rebirths. The true adepts, who are the gurus of lanus, are in no need of the directions for following the higher spiritual path provided by the voice of the silence. This is because that spiritual path is already familiar terrain for them due to their own ascents of it and their achievements of the enumerated higher initiatic degrees of this path, whereby they reach their lofty spiritual statures and are thus able to become gurus. To some it may seem dismissive to launch into a discussion of the third of the three fragments that comprise the voice of the silence without giving proper acknowledgement or tribute to the first two fragments. Certainly, all three fragments are equally significant, each in its own way. Yet what this book uniquely presents in the third fragment is an ultimate and unavoidable predicate in the form of a paramount choice, succinctly stated by David Regal. Quote, the Bodhisattva ideal of Mahayana Buddhism is to renounce one's own liberation until all sentient beings have been liberated. End quote. This choice, therefore, is to renounce entry into nirvana or not. The teachings of the first fragment are fundamentally preparatory to the second and third and make no reference to this choice. The second fragment focuses on the nature of the two paths between which the Lanu must choose, which are presented as that of the Bodhisattva and that of the Pratekya Buddha. The third fragment delves into the heart of this momentous decision. And so our attention here will be on the context of that decision, that choice, and its spiritual ramifications. And it is fair to say, in this regard, that the voice of the silence harbors an unambiguous preference toward both the pre- and post-liberation choices in favor of the bodhisattva ideal of deferring entry into nirvana for the sake of others. But students should always be mindful that this preference neither judges nor condemns those who choose the alternative. As to the pre-liberation choice, a related prior choice precedes the ultimate post-liberation choice, as is evident in the text of the book itself. In the second fragment, the Lanu is exhorted to consider 
that if he or she cannot achieve a purity like that of, quote, the noonday sun upon the snow-capped mount of purity eternal, end quote, then he or she should, quote, choose, O neophyte, a humbler course, end quote, rather than continuing toward the path of woe. This humbler course refers to the path of the Pratekya Buddha, whose destination is entering the bliss of nirvana upon liberation after a contemplative life or lives of meditation and strictly following the dictates outlined in the Buddhist Dharma of the Four Noble Truths, which includes the fourth truth, the yogic eightfold path. In the text thereafter, the Lanu is advised of the end destinations of these two paths and the choice that awaits. Quote, at one end, bliss immediate, and at the other, bliss deferred. Both are of merit the reward. The choice is thine. End quote. Again, in the second fragment, this harbinger of the ultimate choice appears, the post-liberation choice. Quote, Thy time will come for choice, O thou of eager soul, when thou hast reached the end and passed the seven portals. End quote. But until that time arrives and that objective is achieved, the choice between accepting the reward of nirvana or renouncing it still exists as one or the other path to this destination, as confirmed by this passage. Quote, the goal of bliss and the long path of woe are at the furthest ends. Thou canst choose either, O aspirant to sorrow, throughout the coming cycles. End quote. So this choice remains or continues to exist for the Lanu, according to the text, throughout the coming cycles of transmigration, being the succeeding turns of the wheel of death and rebirth for the Lanu until the point of liberation is reached. In some ways, the pre-liberation choice to begin following the way of the bodhisattva is as compelling as the post-liberation choice of entering the bliss of nirvana or deferring that entry in order to assist all of humanity to achieve liberation. Moreover, it may seem counterintuitive at first glance that a lanu or junior initiate would not have already affirmatively chosen the path of the bodhisattva. This is because this path entails lifetimes of painful sacrifice, strict purification, and arduous training in one's latent powers to become a truly effective teacher of the Dharma, a bringer of light. But we know from history that certainly accepted chelas of adepts and possibly junior initiates have fallen prey to the desires of their outer persons and failed in their attempts to ascend the higher reaches of this path and its further initiations. K.H. noted that, quote, unless possessed of spiritual as well as of physical unselfishness, a chela, whether selected or not, must perish as a chela in the long run. Self-personality, vanity, and conceit harbored in the higher principles are enormously more dangerous than the same defects inherent only in the lower physical nature of man. End quote. Later, on the same page, the adept advises his correspondent to recall familiar historic examples of failed chelas. Quote, Bring to your memory the cases of Fern, Murad Ali, 
and Bishan Lal, good friend, and remember what you have learned. End quote. One could add to this documented list Laurel Holloway and Mohini Chatterjee, Chalas who both effectively chose to abandon their relationships with KH and pursue their worldly ambitions. The inescapable conclusion of these facts as related to such pre-liberation choice is that change happens and that life in this physical world is impermanent, as the Buddha repeatedly reminds us. Everything we discover is subject to change, including the aspiration to remain on the path of the bodhisattva in order to defer entry into nirvana and become a bodhisattva of the nirmanakaya. The spiritual wayfarer must survive years of probation to become a chela, to be formally accepted as a chela of an adept guru, and then to become a lanu or an initiate in that adept's order. But none of this is a guarantee that the lanu will eventually succeed in the quest of liberation or indeed will not ultimately choose entry into nirvana as a pratekya buddha when liberation is achieved. In other words, the first consequential pre-liberation choice of which path to follow does not necessarily determine the post-liberation choice. As we have seen, implicit in the various references to choice in the voice of the silence is that more than a single choice confronts the spiritual wayfarer. But all such prior choices are subsumed by the very last choice described at the end of the book. There, at the end of his or her long transmigrational journey, where the Lanu crosses, quote, the gate of final knowledge, end quote, the sacred ultimatum is put, quote, Thou art now enlightened. Choose thy way, end quote. At this apex point, the most consequential and pivotal choice of the Lanu's entire spiritual journey through multiple lifetimes as a human being is made by the Lanu between renunciation of nirvana or not. Those lanus whose pre-liberation choice to follow the path of the bodhisattva aligns with and completes their post-liberation choice then become bodhisattvas for the sake of humanity into the distant future. These sequential choices just described to repeat reflect the inherent preference in the voice of the silence. One could speculate, however, that an advanced spiritual wayfarer on the higher spiritual path who first elected to follow the path of a Pratekya Buddha could make a decision, could choose, upon liberation, to renounce or defer entry into Nirvana and become a Bodhisattva to assist others in achieving liberation. But such a being would arguably have forfeited decades, if not lifetimes, of training and preparation to best assist others in this mission. Alternatively, one could speculate that Alanu, who chose the pre-liberation path of the Bodhisattva, could make the decision upon liberation to immediately enter Nirvana. But such a being would arguably have wasted decades, if not lifetimes, of extreme sacrifice and highly specialized training. This unique post-liberation choice is sui generis, is of itself, and so remains forever open. The jivan mukti, regardless of the initial pre-liberation choice made, remains free to choose, which ultimate choice is the ultimate expression 
of free will. Ascending the path from the pre-liberation choice toward the post-liberation choice, following the achievement of liberation from the wheel of death and rebirth, which in Pali is called Vimutti, requires an extraordinary application of will by the Lanu. The origin or source of this application of will reduces to a question of whether the Lanu has achieved true free will. By this we mean what the early Greek philosopher Epictetus meant in saying that, quote, no man is free who is not master of himself. That quote is so succinct and good, I will repeat it again in the feminine form. No woman is free who is not master of herself. End quote. In this wonderfully succinct sentence, the master refers to one's inner self or person, while himself or herself refers to the outer self or person and the proverbial tension between them. It also encapsulates the esoteric view of free will, which rests in the acknowledgement and understanding of the principle of these two selves, the inner or higher self and the outer or lower self, which are often in conflict throughout the trials of the seven portals set forth in the third fragment of the voice of the silence. The principle of the two selves was skillfully articulated by Ananda Kumaraswamy, among the greatest modern expositors of the Philosophia Perennis, who wrote that, quote, our sense of free will is as valid in itself as our sense of being, being the inner person, and as invalid as our sense of being so-and-so, or the outer person. There is a free will, a will that is unconstrained by anything external to its own nature. But it is only ours to the extent that we have abandoned all that we mean in common sense by ourselves and our own willing. Only his service is perfect freedom. And when Kumara Swami says, only his, he means the inner person. Only his service is perfect freedom." End quote. The nature of the eminent choice that involves which of the two selves, inner or outer, shall predominate in one's incarnate existence and thus direct the Lanu toward either alternative of the pre- or post-liberation choice is one that effectively is identical to the principle of free will. Kumara Swami noted that within the entire wisdom tradition, quote, the natures and character of the two selves, inner and outer, are treated at great length. And the importance of the resolution of their inner conflict emphasized. No man being at peace with himself until an agreement has been reached as to which shall rule." End quote. Whether the inner or outer self shall rule thus becomes the choice that is essentially inextricable from, if not identical to, the momentous and most consequential pre- and post-liberation choices facing the Lanu in the voice of the silence. The result of choosing the outer person as one's ruler, which is equal to failing to choose the inner person, is that of continued death and rebirth, and so is always a fatal choice. <laughs> 
or being ever subject to suffering and fate. Not only is this alternative fatal, but it is often described in the perennial philosophy as the way of bondage, where the outer person has imprisoned the inner and acts as its jailer, a condition in which no true free will can exist. The result of the other alternative is living and being within the inner person, having chosen that as one's ruler. This choice opens the way to everlasting liberation from the fatal cycle of bondage resulting from the whims and desires of the outer person, and in ever greater degrees synchronizing or joining one's will to the universal or cosmic will, whose end result is complete free will. Where this choice is made, it is fundamentally baptismal and initiatic, from corruptible mortality to incorruptible immortality. Accordingly, in the Philosophia Perennis, free will occurs only to the extent that the successful wayfarer first chooses to be ruled by the inner self and is thus able to further synchronize his or her individual will operating through the inner person or Atma Buddhimanas to the universal or cosmic will. When this occurs to a greater extent, the wayfarer correspondingly ceases to be faced with deciding between any consequential choices of two or more alternatives, since he or she has, in effect, freely synthesized with right or spiritually consistent choices by having centered the consciousness, or chosen the ruler, within and as the inner person. Thereafter, at each such point of consequential choice, the Lanu knows there is only one spiritually right thing to do. It then becomes a question of whether he or she has the strength and courage to succeed once having freely willed to do it. Though the greater the synchronization the Lanu has made with the universal or cosmic will, the easier this becomes. This is the condition to which Kumara Swami referred when he wrote that, quote, in this perennial philosophy, we are unfree to the extent that our willing is determined by the desires of the outer man and free to the extent that the outer man has learned to act and to will not only for himself, but as the agent of the inner man, our real self." End quote. And so at the consequential moment of the pre-liberation choice, there appears an effective confluence of the path toward achieving free will and the path of the bodhisattva, which paths, it could be argued, have become one and the same at this point. In a real sense, The Voice of the Silence is a book about choices, and the act of choosing necessarily implicates the principle of free will. The intrinsic preference mentioned above between the choices be within The Voice of the Silence is essentially a recognition that of the three fragments of the translation, the entire third fragment is wholly devoted to one of the two choices presented to the Lanu. This choice favors renunciation of entering nirvana by following the path of the bodhisattva, which is one of tireless and rigorous training and sacrifice and pain, the path of woe. It requires selfless mastery of the seven portals, 
part of which is activation of the Siddhis, being the most dangerous of undertakings. This danger arises where the slightest forensic residue of selfishness or lust for power, recognition, or acquisition still exists within the wayfarer when those powers are activated, which invariably leads to the most dire and tragic of consequences. All along the path, from its beginning to the final objective of liberation, there are choices to be made, both consequential and inconsequential. And as to the consequential choices, to the extent that the spiritual wayfarer and the Lanu find their way along this path using the light of their inner person, the Atma Buddhimanas, they will remain free of the bondage of their outer persons making wrong choices. But that risk steadily diminishes up to the point where the Lanu must choose, following liberation, either to enter Nirvana or to defer that entry for the sake of all other sentient beings. One without free will who chooses to follow the path of the Bodhisattva prior to liberation might have made that choice only for the sake of developing Siddhis in servitude to his or her outer self, or for other such selfish reasons. But the Lanu, who has sufficiently synchronized his or her will to the universal or cosmic will, and so attains free will, then simply defaults to such choices being made by the inner self. At that consecrated altitude, on the higher spiritual path, the right pre-liberation and post-liberation choices, as explained in the voice of the silence, will become evident, and in either event, humanity will be served. Thank you for your attention.